Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to today's webinar where we're going to be talking about some of the impacts that Tin Can is having and, and specifically how eight different companies are, are using Tin Can or the Experience API today. And I think this marks kind of a, a big change in some of the webinars that we've been giving. We've Over the last few, we've featured how individual companies are doing things within their organizations and people who were very pioneering and went through you know, a lot of effort to go build things on their own and pull things together. Now, I think the big change that we're going to start to see here is we're going to show you a series of tools that you can use right now. These are tools that are on the market that we've you know, come across and that we, we see as particularly innovative and useful and I'll give you low-hanging fruit, easy things that you can start to do within your organization right now without having to go build out custom things. And, and I think this is re really where the power of Tin Can is starting to show. It's when a standard allows companies to bring innovative tools to market that we're going to start to see this big wave of innovation because those tools make it easy for people to go out and, and do things on their own without having to have specialized knowledge and software developers. They make it easy for the, the instructional designer and the, you know, the regular content authors to go out and do stuff. And so today we're going to look we're going to bring you six different tools that we're going to show you, as well as two kind of really inspirational use cases of people who have put together just some super, super cool stuff to kind of inspire you about things you might want to be able to do in your organization. So real quick, this is Mike Rustasy. I am your host today, and we're going to be going through a bunch of things, including nine different presenters on this webinar from all over the world. So please bear with us as we try to shuffle the microphone and the screen around through there. Our rehearsal went much better than expected, so that so I hope it will continue to be smooth as we go through here. Uh, but it's been a, been a complicated endeavor, and I hope that it comes off really well and, and is really interesting for everybody here. Uh, a couple bits of logistics. Feel free to go ahead and ask questions in the question bar and your webinar panel over there. We have a couple people in the background who will be answering some of those on the chat. And we've tried to save some time at the end to go through and address as many of them as we can uh, during the webinar. But as we always do, uh, we will answer all of those questions after the webinar and email you out the full list of responses uh, after we're all wrapped up over here and can coordinate all these people bringing in their answers and stuff. And you know, We'll also give you an opportunity at the end there to request some time um, either with us to discuss how some of these things might apply to your organizations or the individual folks who are presenting over here to discuss their solutions or the, or the projects they put together. The, the people on the webinar here are all really excited to be sharing and excited about what's happening in the industry and I think that I'll be very, very eager and anxious to talk to you about about that and how things might uh, work within your organization. So we're, we're going to kick things off and uh, we're going to start with Alex Mackman from CM Group who's going to tell you about um, some of his tools, Luminosity, and how they are taking advantage of Tin Can. So Alex, uh, you are first. Go ahead and take it away. Okay, um, thank you, Mike. Um, hello, everybody. My name's uh, Alex Mackman. I'm the technical director at CM Group, a learning technologies company with offices in the UK and the US, and the company behind the Luminosity range of products, including the Luminosity LMS. So, Mike, I don't seem to have control of the slides. Would you advance yeah. them for me, please? There, there's our first glitch. I think I made you a presenter instead of giving you the keyboard and mouse. There we go. That. If you could just move me forward a slide, that would be great. There we are. You should have control now. First error is on me. Okay. All right. Now I need to go back one. Hold on. Okay, so um, we were very early adopters of Tin Can, um, but why did we decide to embrace it throughout our product set? Well, its emergence coincided rather well with us building a mobile-first true cloud learning management system, a system that we called Luminosity LMS. It helped solve a lot of technical challenges and simplified our development in a number of areas. 
Trying to make SCORM work in disconnected scenarios on mobile devices is tough, and at the end of the day, of course, SCORM simply wasn't built with these types of scenarios in mind. Remember with SCORM, you know, we're talking about a 15-year-old technology. Now, of course, learning happens everywhere, and only a tiny proportion of this is through e-learning pushed from an LMS. So Tin Can now enables us to track a much wider range of learning activities, over and above a learner's progression through a conventional e-learning course. For example, we can use Tin Can now to track all content access and to drive analytics, which provides valuable insights for customers. It helps organizations determine which of their learning strategies and learning content is proving most successful, providing measurable business benefits. And Tin Can enables us to track, for example, when people view videos, open PDF documents, interact with enterprise social networks, and we can also track classroom-based uh, training, seminar attendance, reading books, watching YouTube videos, reading articles on the web, and quite a lot more besides. So how does TinCan work within our products? Well, within our LMS, we now have a TinCan Learning Record Store, or LRS, at its heart. This is the central repository that tracks learning activities, those occurring both inside and outside of the LMS. Not only does the LRS drive all of our reports, but it's also now central to the platform's gamification engine. Now, an LMS with gamification enables you to introduce elements of competition with points-based leaderboards, the allocation of badges, medals, and trophies to recognize special achievements. We found in practice that in the right scenarios and used appropriately, that this really does provide additional motivation for people, and particularly in mobile app scenarios, it helps drive and maintain app adoption and engagement over prolonged periods. We also have a rapid HTML-based e-learning authoring tool called Luminosity Studio. This now includes a tin can publication option in addition to the existing SCORM options. And finally, we have a range of native apps for iOS, Android, and Windows. These Luminosity Mentor apps provided alongside the LMS support offline content consumption. And with tin can, we're able to track in detail everything that goes on inside the apps and track this even when the device is offline. So let me talk about some of the real business impact this has had. Here are just a few examples of some customers using the Luminosity LMS and making the most of its tin can feature set. The implementation for Microsoft HR is particularly interesting. New managers joining the organization globally are given an app either for their Windows 8 phone or tablet, and they use this to receive a range of management-related education and training provided by HR. Yammer integration from within the app also enables social discussion and interaction. Different topics are sent out from month to month, all from the cloud-based LMS, and then each month users are also sent quizzes on a particular management topic, and from these and other activities they can perform within the apps, they're able to earn points. An in-app leaderboard shows where they sit in relation to other new managers who joined within the same time period. As specific points thresholds are, are reached, users are allocated achievement badges. And the gamification solution is all driven from the tin can activity statements hitting the LRS. And this has really helped with engagement levels, providing added motivation and incentive for app users. We also provided apps for Telefonica O2 on iOS, Android, and Windows platforms. And they're using the Luminosity LMS to push out content to their staff. Tin can is used to track activities occurring within the app. And a particularly interesting scenario here is the use of QR codes. The app lets the user scan a QR code and perform a number of actions. One is to scan a code to retrieve information at the point of need, a great performance support scenario, and the other is to scan a QR code to register attendance on a training session. An end of course evaluation form is a great place to include a QR code. Simply scan the code and the user registers their attendance. Under the covers, this generates a tin can statement to track the session attendance. Now TV, part of the Sky Corporation, are also benefiting from the gamification aspects of the solution, and they're using the system to educate high street retailers reselling their Now TV packages. And finally, we have Deloitte, who have been able to mobile enable their compliance training initiatives with tin can content running within native mobile apps on iOS and Android phones. So for more information about the Luminosity LMS, its use of Tin Can and our other products and related content development services, and to read more about the customer case studies that I've only had time to briefly touch upon, you can find us at www.cm-group.co.uk. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, interesting stuff over there. Next up, we've got Stephen Bowler from Knowledge Guru. Stephen, go ahead. Thanks, Mike. Uh, first of all, yeah, we're with uh, 
Knowledge Guru is a product of bottom line performance. And we uh, had some interesting questions to answer when we saw that Tin Can was available and we wanted to include it uh, in our solution. So Knowledge Guru, to give you some background, is a platform for building serious games. The key uh, point here is that the games use the science of learning and remembering. It's embedded in the games to increase retention. Uh, the games are fast to produce and there's no game design knowledge required uh, for these games. So the platform allows you to produce a variety of different games using some pre-built templates that all have the learning science built in. And those games, even before we um, implemented Tin Can, had some robust tracking that was already a part of it. It was actually um, set up to be able to be standalone from an LMS uh, to be a turnkey solution for those that didn't even want to go through their LMS. So we were tracking a lot of data and Tin Can opened up some different possibilities of how we could use that data. So you're seeing some reports that are native to Knowledge Guru, uh, pulling uh, learning objectives, um, individual questions for different groups of learners, how they were performing, and also tracking uh, performance challenges, which actually happen uh, outside of the game, but count as part of the game in the quest game type that we have. So we were pulling a lot of data and we were capable of tracking it already. We have robust native reporting, but we wanted to be able to provide LMS tracking uh, while preserving the cloud-based play, the leaderboards, all of the game elements and things that, were ha that are just easier to have happen outside of an e-learning course, certain features of our games do not work in the SCORM version that we have available. Um, we have a SCORM version, but the full version um, has more features in it. So some organizations, we realize many of our customers do need all of their learning experiences tracked in one single location, not in the separate databases. So we wanted to use Tin Can to pull that into um, an LMS via an LRS. So it works very simply in Knowledge Guru. Uh, the administrator just inputs the LRS settings in our dashboard. Uh, that causes the game data to flow to the LRS. Um, and then the administrator can use the native reports of Knowledge Guru, um, but also use the data visualizations and reporting that they have in their LRS and there's additional data export possible via CSV. So I have a couple screenshots to show you. Um, this is the Knowledge Guru dashboard, and you can see I've put in my LRS information. Um, once I've updated that, the information is going to start showing up in the activity stream um, in this particular screenshot from Watershed LRS. You can see a variety of different player data is showing up. Um, and then I can manipulate that um, however I wish within the LRS. So what we could do that we couldn't do before. Um, organizations are able to offer the full Knowledge Guru gameplay experience with our leaderboards, uh, with tablet um, play, um, and still track data in an LMS. Um, they don't have to choose between the SCORM version where they get the full LMS tracking or nothing. Uh, they can still use the native Knowledge Guru reports, um, which are very robust and have a lot of data, but they can also store the key data in their LMS seamlessly. And then also having Experience API or Tin Can allows us to show kind of a proof of concept um, for those of our customers that are uh, running pilots of Tin Can to see what's possible and how they could expand it throughout their organization. Uh, and finally, this is a, a major point of differentiation. Uh, the game content and reports can change on the fly. There's no need to upload a new version of the game to an LMS um, to um, have the data be accurate and continue to update. So the business impact, um, we're able to offer a more cost-effective solution. We're able to essentially allow some customers who do not have a robust LMS to bootstrap uh, Knowledge Guru with an LRS um, and still get the central data tracking. Um, we're able to allow companies who do need that centralized tracking, say for compliance training, they don't want to have it in the Knowledge Guru database and their LMS. They can still use the gaming still get the learning science and be innovative. That's all we have. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Next up, we've got uh, Nick Washburn from Riptide. And uh, th this is, we're switching now over from a couple of tools to our just a really fascinating use case that I, I, find, I find really cool to see this you know, happening out in the real world. I, I think <clears throat> you will too. Go ahead, Nick. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. 
Um, so I'm Nick Washburn. I'm the uh, director for the learning division at Riptide Software, where we're building a configurable platform of learning services. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing as a company um, and then get right into my use case. So we're founded in 1995. We're a CMMI level four software development company and the elements program uh, of products is uh, is a, a tailored CMMI. It's a capability uh, maturity model that's uh, that was generated by Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we're a, a small business. In the last uh, two years, we were named in the top 100 uh, simulation and training technology companies here in, uh, in the U.S. Um, so why do we adopt XAPI? Uh, myself and my lead engineer, we're participants in the 22-person uh, work group that created, uh, worked on the spec, and we're uh, made a small contribution, but we're still very uh, involved in the community. And this is kind of a, a look at the logical architecture diagram of the platform of services we're building. Um, uh, XAPI works to track all uh, user interactions and activities uh, going on in our, in our uh, client deployment, in, uh, I mean in our current product. And we have a uh, growing uh, use case of XAPI um, with, our, with our clients. And I just put a few screenshots of a few things here. As a third-party provider, um, we're providing the delivery mechanism to deliver e-learning any to any device in any language uh, for some of our clients to their clients all over the world, uh, large employee populations like uh, Eli Lilly, Tech Data, Coca-Cola. Those are some of the uh, audiences that we're uh, delivering our product to. And we also have gamification happening on dashboards and social media where we extended the LRS uh, to accommodate social media and things like that. So we do have a, a growing list of uh, XAPI use case if you want to check us out. I want to get right into uh, what I came here or what we're going to talk about, the case study for Reaper. So what we discovered as a company that does a lot of uh, um, training on training ranges in the military, uh, automated training ranges, so there's a software running the training range, was that the range data doesn't make it off of the training range. Uh, it's, uh, it's a remote geographical location, and we wanted to help, uh, pr provide a proof of principle that was a uniform mechanism for collecting that data, and we want to use XAPI for it. The proof of principle that we uh, created is, is running right now, and it's collecting shot data. It's really interesting um, use case, and I can speak about what we did directly here in this diagram. So we, uh, we instrumented, um, and XAPI is really fast and easy to work with. It's not difficult to get a disparate proprietary software uh, uh, speaking XAPI and XAPI statements. And um, we, uh, we instrumented this, this, uh, pro this uh, training software, automated training software, to talk XAPI and put an LRS in, uh, on the training range and use hardware encryption to do LRS to LRS communication. And here at, at our secure facility, was where we mined the data and we created uh, different data views for different audiences. So we wanted to uh, create a data v visualization view for the researcher, for the individual soldier, and for the uh, coach or the, or the trainer. We also wanted to come up with a way to automate the scorecard results. So right now there's guys that are doing manual input to the digital training management system and we wanted to make it, uh, make the, show the ability to automate that and, uh, and uh, put, take away some of the manual labor. And um, we, uh, we, as the LRS data is coming into um, our headquarters here, we used functional reactive programming to kind of mine the activity stream as it's coming in for different algorithms in the shot patterns. There's uh, four basic uh, shooting fundamentals that the soldiers are trying to focus on. And you can tell based on their shot pattern, and we're, get, we're getting each of the XY coordinates of all the shots, and we're drawing heat maps and all that, and we're able to discern and, and provide uh, instructional multimedia and really we just took directly from the field manual that says oh hey you're breathing wrong here's how to breathe better but we uh, showed that ability as well in this to provide just-in-time training to the soldier on the field that hey look at these heat maps you might uh, have a problem with your breathing look at look at the uh, training manual about that so I think I covered everything that we did in the in the uh, in the use case and I think I, I put some screenshots here. So here's some of the screenshots of the data views. The, um, the IMI that we did, interactive multimedia instruction that we delivered, 
uh, to them the corrective media was also instrumented with XAPI. So now the coach can see if someone was sent to IMI and whether or not they looked at it and how long they looked at it. This is a, a, a look at the soldier's view and he can click on this and see a heat map of how he did. And then the coaches and the commander's views and um, uh, uh, the coaches can also look at the bullet maps. One of the things that came out of this program that was so interesting was that there was an operational application. So um, if you look here at the research review, you're actually looking at 11,250 shots taken at all these lanes and all of these targets. And you can see, I don't know if I have one here, but this one almost looks like the target's obstructed. And so now you can start to look, get a range operational view and start to get data from your automated targets and, and see how things are run. Um, in this research, this research search review, also, we also provided the ability for the researcher themselves to, because researchers just want the data, um, so they can look at, they can filter through some of the data and then export a CSV so they can put it into their data analysis tools because this wouldn't be a be all and end all for a researcher by any means. Um, I think that might be it. So that's it. If you want to learn more, uh, go to Riptide Software or go to learning.riptidesoftware.com and click on the learning division and you can find out more about what we're doing. Well, thanks, Nick. I love hearing about that use case, just watching you know, soldiers out in the real world firing shots on firing rangers, capturing that, giving them intelligent tutoring as a result. You know, it's, just a, it's a great use case and showing the power of what unlocking some of these things can do. Uh, next up, we've got Art Workentine from RISC. Art, take it away. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Art Workentine, president of RISC Incorporated. RISC has been providing a virtual training assistant learning management system since 1992. Um, we were also an early adopter of the 10CAN technology and we have an LRS embedded in our LMS so we can capture all uh, learning experiences. But today I'm actually not going to talk about our LMS. I'm going to look at a unique 10CAN project that we did for a customer. Uh, we were approached by a customer uh, with some issues. One, they had a lot of training manuals that they were handing out on USB. They're a grid provider uh, for the electrical grid. Uh, they're heavily regulated. They do a lot of training uh, in PDF manuals and they have a need for the students to mark up the documents and be able to pull those markups back at their desk uh, to see what they were making annotations on. Uh, they had a very large existing PDF library. Um, we wanted them to switch to an e-reader to make this application a little easier, but they needed to stick with PDF, so we worked with that. Um, they had a pie in the sky goal that we thought at the time, before we looked at XAPI for this, that they wanted to track those annotations in order to be able to make improvements in their documents uh, for future training sessions. Uh, the way this works is we work with Float Mobile to develop a PDF annotator and integrate it with our existing LRS that's embedded inside of the LMS. When a student uh, makes annotations, they're actually stored in the cloud in the LRS and the documents are also stored in the cloud. This was actually a security requirement to the customer. Um, they didn't want uncontrolled documents floating around uh, about running the grid on the East Coast, so uh, they're stored in the clouds and the students, unless they log in through the LMS, have no direct access to the documents or to the annotations that they've made. Um, there's both a browser and iPad version of the application uh, so the students can make annotations at their desktop or in the classroom. Uh, they can then go back uh, home to their, uh, to their client workplace and pull those annotations up uh, with the iPad or with the browser. Um, and the, it works with many different browsers, in, including those on Android. Uh, and then we're using the LRS, of course, to provide reporting uh, back to the owner of the system. This is just a screenshot of one of the examples of the annotation on the iPad version. Uh, you can see we've got a note icon on the right and the student has entered a note uh, and then they can come back at any time and edit these notes, add additional notes or remove them. Uh, they also have the ability to highlight and underline uh, and some additional annotation types that we've added. Um, I mentioned the reporting. Uh, we worked with Making Better to make a dashboard. Uh, for the reporting, uh, the client can use this to see which documents have been opened, which have received annotations, which pages in the document have received the most annotations, 
uh, information that they can use to improve their training materials for future use. The business impact by using Tin Can, we were allowed to track all those LRS annotations, um, determine the pages and phrases that are getting the most annotation so we can see where there might be problems in the documentation. We can see all the reader comments. Uh, we can actually group them uh, according to what type of comments there are to help us improve the documents. Uh, and we can find out which documents are actually being used. Perhaps we're distributing training materials that are not actually being used by the clients. So we can either improve those or remove them from the training altogether. And then we use this or the client uses it to improve their documentation again for future impact uh, on their students. And that was it for me. Thank you. Great. Great. Th thanks a lot, Art. Great to see all of the cool stuff you've got going on. Next up, we have Nick Stevenson from Training Evidence Solutions. Nick, go ahead and take it away. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, sorry, I'm just seeing if I've got control of the keyboard here. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so I'm Nick Stevenson, our founder and CEO of Training Evidence Systems, and we're an Australian software as a service company um, that's been in the training business for around 10 years now. Um, we help our clients capture on-the-job training and performance data. Um, the end goal being is to help our clients measure the impact of training and ultimately help them make better training investments. Um, so to capture this on-the-job data, we have some apps, including observation checklist for carrying out on-the-job uh, workplace assessments. We have attendance for managing classroom training and scheduling, and coach, uh, which facilitates and records on-the-job coaching. And our clients operate in a really wide range of industries, um, from assessing doctors and hospitals to managing sales skills and retail stores to compliance training on industrial work sites. And um, although our clients are really different, um, the one thing they all have in common is they want to be able to easily share the data collected in TES with their other business systems. And this is really the first reason we invested in TinCan API. It means the data that our system collects and the insights that our data generates can easily and quickly be shared with other business systems. And literally it takes minutes and it's flexible um, in setting up. Um, the second reason and the longer term sort of reason um, we've invested in TinCan is that it provides a really fast and lightweight uh, way to integrate training and performance uh, technology. And so what do I really mean by that? Um, there's so much innovation happening in the uh, training and HR tech space, you know, as you can see today for some of the demonstrations. Um, there's a bunch of companies out there solving lots of really interesting L&D and performance problems. And we feel strongly that Tin Can is just positioned to be the glue um, that is going to enable organizations to bring these technologies together really quickly and painlessly. Um, so organizations are going to be able to put together training infrastructure using a series of apps and systems that meet their specific requirements. And so all of a sudden, I think we're going to see, you know, corporate training departments in particular become very nimble and reactive to business needs. So um, how does TinCan work in TES? Um, we've tried to make it really simple. Um, so firstly, setting up um, is just a matter of filling in um, some details in a web form, like you can see on screen, and that will get you started sending statements. Past that point, uh, what happens is, um, say we have people in the field using our apps, um, data is sent to TES, where it goes into the evidence stream. Um, which is like a moment-by-moment -moment audit trail of all the data we collect. From there, um, from that data, um, tin can statements are formed and generated. So, for example, we might send out a statement in this example that Emily completed the customer greeting observation checklist. Um, so let's take a really quick look just conceptually at how tin can improves things for our customers. Um, so in this diagram, you can see we take the view that training of employees happens over time. Um, in this example, we have a person who is attending some classroom training, uh, which is attracted by our attendance apps. They're then being observed on the job by their supervisor through the observation checklist. They then undergo some coaching and performance management with the coach app, and then again, they're reassessed uh, to see if there's any improvement. So we're collecting a bunch of information, which is useful by itself, 
Um, but we can make the data even more useful by sending it to other systems to be combined with other business information. So in this next screen, um, uh, we're sending stin, uh, tin can statements to a third party system. So this, in this example, a learning record store. Um, and the employees on the job, job performance data can be combined with other HR information. So e-learning results from a learning management system, attitudinal data from employee surveys, um, and other performance data such as sales figures. And it can all be brought together and reported on. So our customers can really start then to explore the link between training and job performance, both at an individual and organisation level. Um, so um, just in summary, uh, we play in the mobile space and we capture everything that happens out in the field where you couldn't traditionally collect data. Um, tin can API is how we connect the dots and bring this data to the rest of the business. Um, and that's it for me. Uh, thanks for your time. Great. Thank, thanks a lot, Nick. Next up, we've got Jonathan Archibald from Tesello. Jonathan, let me get you set up here and go ahead and take it away. Hi, um, I'm Jonathan. Um, I'm from a company called Brightwave. We're a UK-based uh, e-learning company. Um, sorry, Mike, I'm just trying to change the slides. I'll, I'll get that one for you. Sometimes that makes gets it started. If you don't, if it doesn't work, let me know. I'll get get the rest of them for you. There we go. Hi, let's start again. So, hi, I'm John Archibald. Um, I'm from Brightwave. Um, we're based in the UK. Um, we are an e-learning uh, provider, so we build content for our clients, and we also build uh, learning products. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about one of our products called Tesla, which is an XAPA enabled total learning system. So the total learning system is, um, it comprises of an LMS, um, it comprises of a social learning tool, it comprises of coaching and curation tools, and underpinning it all is an XAPI enabled LRS. Um, so Tesla um, uses the XAPI. Um, it's fundamental to how it works. Um, at the heart of, it, of Tesla is its ability to capture informal learning experiences. So within Tesla, um, learners capture informal learning experiences. They store them in their LRS. Um, they're then able to then share them into the community, which then other people are able to then view their learning experiences, gain knowledge from them. Um, coaches are able to coach people, etc. But at the heart of it is capturing these uh, e-learning, sorry, these informal learning experiences, and that's where the tin can comes in. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just briefly show you um, how uh, this works using some screenshots. Um, the story starts uh, away from the uh, Tesla itself. Sorry, this, sorry, Mike, the slides are not changing. Could you knock me on one, please? Um, so the story starts um, within the browser, so well away from Tesla. Um, we uh, do a lot of learning on the internet, I know uh, I do. Uh, I'm a programmer, so I learn most of my things off Stack Overflow. Um, I dread to think what I'd be do without it. Um, so, um, what, but what happens with that learning once it's done? It's not tracked, um, it just disappears. So what uh, Tesla does is we give you a bookmarklet in the browser. Um, so you find a particularly useful web page like this one about the Tin Can API. Um, and we just click the Save Experience button, which then uh, captures the information from the page, uh, pulls out all the information like the title and the description and things like that, and I can add to the description if I want. And then that saves it back to Tesla in the background. And what I can do then is just carry on. I don't need to be on Tesla at all. Just uh, I could go the whole evening um, learning about things on the internet and storing them in. Uh, Tesla via the XAPI in the bookmarklet. But at some point, I'd want to go back to Tesla and look at what I've learned. So we'll go back into Tesla and we'll go to the, the My Experiences section in Tesla. And this is where the LRS bit really is. So on the screen, we can see um, the learning experiences that I've stored. And at the top, um, in very tiny writing, you can see the, uh, the Tin Can web page that we've just uh, saved by the bookmarklet. 
Um, but at this point, the, the learning is very personal to me. It's in my list. No one else can see this. But what I want to do is I think that, that Tin Can API uh, web page that we just read is really interesting, and I want to share that with my colleagues. So I can quickly push the share button. Um, that then pops up a little dialogue, allowing me to add a little note to then share it in share it with my employee, my colleagues. And then that goes into the community feed, and then from there, other people can do that learning experience. They can comment on it, they can like it, and so on. So that is one activity provider um, in Tesla. We've got a few others. So Tesla has a, a free form wizard within it, allowing you to create uh, any kind of learning experience using the wizard. Um, once you're logged on to Tesla, but it also has um, other tools to help you on the go, such as a native mobile app for iOS and Android. Um, those use the, the kind of the strengths of the devices to allow you to capture learning experiences. So, for example, say you went to an event, um, you could take a little video of um, a particular talk that you liked. Um, you can save that as an experience, um, and it attaches the video. Uh, as an attachment to the XAPI statement and then send it to the LRS. And there's some unique things within Tesla to allow us to uh, encode that video and then play back through the Tesla website. So they're just a couple of things uh, where activity providers are prizing informal learning into Tesla. The learners can then keep that as their own, they can share it um, and the, the rest of the community can then benefit from learning experiences that would have been lost before we had the XAPI. Um, and you could do these things before you have the XAPI, but it was very difficult to do. There wasn't a standard way of doing it. Everyone was doing it slightly differently. Um, but with the XAPI, it allows us to create compliant activity providers such as the mobile app, such as the bookmarklet. In the future, other providers could provide activities to do on Tesla without them having to use our custom API, they just use the X API. Um, but all the technology is great um, and it's wonderful, but what business impact does um, the tin can bring to Tesla? Oh, let's go back one slide. Um, Tesla has been around for about two years and over that time we've, glo we've grown a global client list. Uh, we've got a few logos on screen, the big literary logo screen. Um, I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. Um, so we've got uh, Unison. Uh, Unison uh, are a public uh, sector union in the UK. Um, they use Tesla to connect uh, 40,000 other activists across the country together. Um, before they used to learn in silos, they didn't use to share information across the country. Uh, but now with Tesla, what they can do is capture their learning experiences by the X API share best practice through the social learning, share those experiences, and that allows them to coordinate much better the, the actions that they do on the ground. We also have 3M. 3M uh, used Tesla. Uh, they, the site is called Tesla Brazis University. Um, they use it to um, teach product knowledge training across Europe. So they have a lot of technical products um, and Tesla uh, allows them to distribute their learning, but also allow uh, people who use their products to then um, feed back through the XAPI and talk socially on the social systems. So that is a very, very quick uh, look at Tesla. Um, if you want to know more, check out the website, look up on Twitter, or send us an email. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. Great to see some of these social learning capabilities making their way out and in informal tracking becoming a reality. Uh, next up, we've got another uh, use case coming from Megan Torrance of Torrance Learning, uh, another one of my you know, favorite ones to hear about how it's actually you know, bringing the museum to life and helping teachers and kids to, to learn a little bit better. So Megan, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm Megan Torrance from uh, Torrance Learning, and we did a project. Oh, I'm trying to advance my slides here. I called RFEV, whoops, too fast, um, which stands for uh, Radio Frequency Education. And we call it this because we started out uh, with RFID tags as the way in which we log students in. So if you think about it this way, when kids come to a children's science museum, like the Hands-On Museum in Ann Arbor uh, in Michigan, 
you let them in the door and they fan out all over the place and it's really hard to have a good sense of what they did on their school field trip. Parents want to know, teachers want to know, and administrators want to know. And this, as, as we started looking with the museum at how do we track this experience, this learning experience, this seemed like a really, really great use case for XAPI because there's a lot of things that we would like to track that SCORM is just not going to be able to handle here. And so that's really what, what, what brought us to XAPI. Um, if you're interested in the, the, the diagrams, this is how it works. So we put an RFID tag on a kid, so it's a 65 cent tag uh, that we, we laminate into a, a little lanyard. When they get near a, uh, an exhibit, the antenna picks them up, recognizes their badge ID, and the screen wakes up and recognizes them by name. For our beta test, we actually, phase one and phase 1.5 are, are very limited tests with only six exhibits. Uh, where we were just doing a, a proof of concept and seeing if we could make the whole thing go, wor go and, and work. But the exhibit screen would then wake up with their name and um, keep track of their interactions with this screen and then send that information to uh, an LRS. We used a free account on SCORM Cloud and actually the, the beauty of this is we, we did the entire XAPI portion of this project in between 50 to 70 hours using copied and pasted JavaScript from the web, a ton of ADL resources and a free account on SCORM Cloud. Uh, so the, the prototypes were, were really quick and cheap. The cool part of this, and I'll show it to you in a little bit, uh, is the dashboard. So the, the dashboard that we were able to provide to the teachers as well as to the museum turned out to be what was uh, the really special part of that, and that's where XAPI uh, really came in. So our exhibits, ask kids questions based on the, um, the, the physical exhibit that was next to them. So um, we started out with some multiple choice things. This is a multiple choice question. It's pretty squirmy. When you answer it, you get a uh, correct or incorrect feedback. We had some questions like this one um, where um, they could choose what kind of information they were interested in reading. Of course, we tracked this. You could fake this with SCORM too. Um, and so those were our initial proof of concept and to me not very interesting until we start to get to some of the more um, creative types of questions that because XAPI lets you track and then display things in a very human readable format, um, really the sky's the limit. So we started asking very free form topics. This is one of my favorite questions because they can answer anything in here. We take the data, drop that into the LRS. We can then use semantic analysis uh, to go and pick out what it is they're talking about. Are they talking about it favorably? Are they talking about it accurately? There's all sorts of possibilities when you let things uh, happen free form like that. We were also able to ask and, and record the answers to more complex questions like this one, um, where the, there is no single correct answer. You drag and drop three parts of a scientific statement um, and, and this statement is actually really aligned to the kids' um, core science principles that they need to be learning in school. The ultimate goal is that we would have um, content that is geared for each kid uh, that's served up to them based on who they are in their badge. So I love the fact that we can start with XAPI capturing data that doesn't fall into the normal squirmy uh, kind of patterns. And then we can ask questions like this because, you know, what do you wonder is perhaps the most important thing for the teacher to know as they leave the museum, what are the kids still interested in? Now, funny enough, we spent on the project a ton of time working out the details of the RFID badges and how to make them work and the antenna and the ranges and everything, but you know what? Kids are used to their technology knowing who they are. It is no big deal to them for their iPad to greet them by name. So the fact that the museum's touch screens would greet them by name was absolutely no big deal to them. The teachers got really, really excited about this. So this is the activity stream. And for our beta test, we just used uh, different scientists' names. But we revealed the, um, you know, the details of the, the XAPI statement. It's very, very human readable. It's like scanning a Twitter stream, and a, a, a teacher could go through and look and see who's doing what and what, what's going on here. 
What it also enables us to do are some really interesting data visualizations. So again, we just went out and grabbed some uh, uh, free JavaScript off the web, built some uh, visualizations. Oh, this is not advancing. Um, uh, on, on the same page so that we could have the, um, the, the teachers be able to see things as, and in real time as it happens. So we'd be able to hand the teachers a, a tablet as they go. So where does this take us and what does this, let this, what does this let us do? Because quite honestly, everything that I've just showed you could be done with custom coded database stuff. In fact, it, it actually was done with custom coded database stuff um, that one of the other software pro partners on the project created. It was only after the fact that we said, hey, we can layer in some XAPI on this. What XAPI will let us do is really start broadening up the experience. And I think Nick Washburn earlier said that you know, basically what it does is it provides a really handy way to grab a whole bunch of disparate efforts all into one place. So we'll be able to be, be tracking what the exhibits themselves are doing when kids log in, what staff are doing when they are do, near children, and you know, are they interacting with kids? Are they running an experiment? Are the kids participating in that? What other real world experiences can we hook into this? And how can we get more and more interesting data out of this as we go? The other interesting thing that we've done with the project um, is, is realize that we needed to move off of the radio frequency ID, the, the RFID, and move to iBeacon. So that's adding a whole extra layer of, of fun and challenge as we pretty much throw out everything for the first two phases and head on into uh, phase two right now. So thanks. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Megan. Uh, next up, we've got Christopher Allen showing us a, a pretty robust <coughs> authoring tool that they have TinCan enabled in Zebra's app. So, Chris, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm Christopher Allen, and uh, we've created a <coughs> excuse me. We've created a visual authoring system uh, really geared towards creating uh, authentic learning environments, um, and we built it really for ourselves first. Uh, Zebra's Apps comes from Allen Interactions, uh, and we provide uh, custom e-learning uh, development for Fortune 500 companies uh, all the time. And we were looking for uh, the next best thing to make ourselves both lean and more agile, uh, as well as be able to tackle big projects, big traditional e-learning projects to mobile projects uh, to serious learning games. Um, what makes us unique and pretty powerful is our visual interface. Uh, and I'll show you a really quick example that uh, explains kind of how we work. So here I've got three objects on the screen and I want to create a rollover. In Zebra, when you click on any object, uh, you get what's called a message center. And inside that message center is everything that the computer knows about this particular object. So it's properties, uh, it's outs, it's ins. Outs you can think of as stuff that a student might do to this particular object. And when I click down and start looking at these categories, here are all the different triggers uh, for a mouse event. And if I wanted to make a rollover and connect clicking on this particular object, this image that's uh, selected on the screen, with the text that's right above it, I'd simply just click and drag to create a wire and connect that user action of its pointer going over the image to then show the text that's on the screen. And if I want that text to then disappear, I click and drag to create another wire and connect it to the message center uh, of the text again to hide it. And I show this example uh, because every one of these user actions, click, double click, pointer over, pointer out, can be quickly used to create uh, an individual statement. Um, so examples. Um, so here's an interaction where I need to adjust the temperature on my Nest thermostat. And at the very top of the screen, you can see as I'm rolling over and changing things, I'm getting a preview of the next statement that could be sent. So here, just right from making connections, like those wires we did in the, in the last screen, um, I can quickly create a whole bunch of different statements that says I'm starting to answer questions, uh, I haven't yet to reach success. Um, and at any time, based on anything that the student does, why we can trigger off all of these statements. So for an author who isn't really a programmer, uh, the 
the big advantage here is, you know, anything that the student does on the screen can be used to create a very custom statement. Um, you know, and it can be dragging and dropping that does the same thing. So, you know, as I start to move objects and place them in a basket, why we can we can send yet another statement. Um, it can also be used to judge a series of statements. So, in in the real world, we often have to do multiple steps in a row before we achieve success or do two or three tasks all at once. Something like increasing the temperature as well as finding within a software system the place where you uh, adjust the, the settings of the thermostat. So again, here's the simulation. We're just moving through, looking at all the different steps that, you know, on the screen you could show it to the student. It doesn't necessarily have to be done that way. That each one of these actions or a series of actions can be stored up uh, and used to send a statement later. Zebra itself can export lots of different ways. Of course, we have all the traditional stuff, right? We can export to SCORM and AICC. You can create a little embedded app uh, out of the output that you create inside Zebra. It can be local. Um, again, you can publish native for both iOS devices and Android devices. That's both phones and tablets. All of these distribution methods can also generate uh, tin can statements. So just because you've uploaded something or created a SCORM package doesn't prevent you from also scoring more meaningful data about your interactions uh, using the Experience API, which is really, really powerful. And, it, and in this period that we are where some LMSs have adopted uh, Tin Can and others aren't, um, we're, our clients are finding this really, really valuable where they can kind of get over the IT hurdles of everything has to be in this particular box, but still being flexible enough to send valuable statements someplace else so that they that authors and students can get at uh, you know what what's needed to either make the current course better um, or or find the the learning gaps and, and address them some other way the last thing that I, I want to talk about so you can create lots of custom stuff like you could with any other authoring system um, our advantages are certainly more on the side of being able to create these authentic experiences that look and feel and show uh, real world consequences um, when we first started putting uh, the Tin Can API and, and really embedding it into everything that we, we do, uh, a member of our QA team uh, happened to be exploring digital badges. And uh, over the course of a couple months, they won a MacArthur uh, grant uh, to mess around with um, interactive badges. Um, and they used Zebra to do that. And the app that they created in Zebra's apps was the interactive badge and they used WordPress to uh, disseminate it to all the students and what makes this really neat and where you know Tin Can really comes in in play is they can issue the badge once and it can grow with the student and it can show what competencies they've reached you know what activities that they've done that really make the badge uh, a, a sign of their actual work um, and so, you know, this is a pretty neat little project that was done here for a, a local Native American group um, where students were, uh, you know, looking at burial sites and all that sort of stuff and working with mentors doing stuff online. Uh, and at the end, they get this digital badge that not only says, I'm proficient, but if anybody wants to investigate what they're proficient in, they open up the Zebra app and they get to see exactly what has been awarded uh, and how. So, a big range of, of opportunity here with Zebra. Um, I'm, I'm glad to have uh, had an opportunity to, to present our capability and how truly uh, integrated the Experience API is um, in our system. Thanks, Mike. Great. Well, well, thank you, Christopher, and thanks to all the presenters as well. Uh, I'm just going to kind of wrap up and summarize some of these things a little bit. So, you know, to, tell you a little bit about what we're doing. We're putting together our watershed learning record sense store, trying to make sense of all of this data. As you can see, there's tons of opportunities to start gathering lots of great information from all kinds of sources, whether it be informal stuff, mobile stuff, stuff happening in the real world on shooting ranges or in museums or PDFs or observation checklists or cool interactive simulations. You know, all of this data is now flowing around and coming in and with, with Watershed what we're trying to do is give you the tools to make sense of that, to put analytics around that and see um, 
and see what's going on, see how things are impacting your organization. Uh, and when we're doing that, we're encouraging everybody to use something we call the watershed method, which is to be very structured in how we are looking at all of this data, to really you know, go into any new implementation asking a question, what do you want to learn, and then structuring all of the information in such a way that you can't answer those questions, and use all of this extra data to, in fact, improve your training organization. So I, I like to end all of our webinars with some key takeaways and you know just I, I went through each of these uh, each of these presentations and kind of took away the the two three four most exciting bullet points I saw from each of these things the key takeaways the key new capabilities that we're seeing over here so you know, starting off with, with Lum luminosity it's a you know mobile first LMS platform mobile's been hard for us before now we're able to see people taking a mobile first approach being able to see learning both inside and outside of the LMS in one place is a huge step forward for things uh, you know, as well as a lot of the gamification stuff they've got to build in there again gamification something so super powerful that you know we're, we're able to start to take advantage of now we're not hindered anymore and you know that that flows right into the knowledge guru K takeaways you know being able to use the, the science of learning theory and designing your games and designing games that increase engagement increase knowledge retention and in this case you know we're able to have both the power of this robust rich cloud-based game delivery and still put stuff into our LMS that used to be an or before we could have one or the other now it's an and and that's a big big transition as well as all the additional data you can start to see now with the thin can data flowing around such so additional features such as leaderboards and you know one of the things Steve mentioned uh, at the end there that is it's just been such a hard problem for so many people is that ability to kind of update content on the fly we had so many challenges with people in the SCORM world. They wanted to just put out a simple update to their content, and that was a very hard thing to go put through a, hard, uh, through a traditional LMS under SCORM. Getting into Riptide, how cool is this for capturing actual soldiers with real guns and giving them intelligent tutoring right at that moment of need based on their incorrect shot patterns and some kind of, you know, just recognizing how those patterns are and what instruction the person most likely needs giving to them while they're sitting there on a train, training range. I think that's just super, super cool. And just the tip of the iceberg of the types of things we can do to blend the real world with the virtual world and take advantage advantage of the power of technology to actually improve educational results. Risk, I, I love Art. He's a pioneering LMS provider. He's not afraid. He's embracing this new model. I see a lot of his competition, a lot of the LMS vendors out there taking very tentative steps into this new world. Art's jumping right in, and uh, I love to see it. Uh, the PDF stuff that they're doing over here super useful and that ability to protect the content again behind that LMS wall is you know very useful functionality for a lot of people. TES, performance observations, attendance tracking, face-to-face -face mentoring stuff, all of these are big pieces of an ecosystem that we're now starting to be able to see assembled from best of breed tools like these. This is another really, really big change. And in the quote unquote old world, to get these types of tools, they had to be part of your big monolithic LMS. And it was kind of you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Now you've got some choices and you know, Jonathan, or <coughs> excuse me, Nick is able to go out and you put together some really, really cool tools that may be a great fit for your organization. You can now plug into your uh, overall systems. Brightwave, Tesla, capturing and harnessing all this informal learning with the social aspects, bringing in coaching and curation into all of these things. Again, this big part of how we learn that we've had no visibility into before, now bringing into our ecosystem. And Megan and, and Torrance, you know, bringing a museum to life using RFIDs and beacons, this latest and greatest technology that, again, is bridging that real world and that virtual world, having the technology enhance what's going on in the real world. She had amazing results on a shoestring budget, and you know it, it was important that this was this was valuable even in a closed environment. The, the statements that she was making helped her implement her project better and faster, more robustly, even in a closed environment where they're not sharing data out across a lot of organ, uh, organizational boundaries. 
uh, Alan and Zebra Zaps, an intuitive visual authoring for serious games and simulations, the, the vast ability to export it to so many different places, and that ability to <clears throat> have a lot of control, what is reported via statements I find super cool. So many of the um, challenges we're facing right now with, with Tin Can is being able to you know, extract all of the data that we want. And I think Zebra Zaps does a, a great job of giving users a lot of control to capture so much rich data, but capture just as much, just what they need. Uh, and I'm excited to see where the R&D project is going with the Mozilla badges with, with Tin Can on the background. So. Uh, looks like we are right up on top of the hour, so uh, Lizelle tells me in our chat window here we have a ton of questions that have come in. We're going to just go ahead and table those and we'll answer them all um, asynchronously via email and a blog post. There's probably a poll about to come up on your screen if it isn't already. If you are interested in hearing more from, any of, from us or from any of these vendors, you know, go ahead and, and indicate that on there and we'll be sure to put somebody in touch with you, and here are all of the various URLs to uh, get in touch with anybody you heard from on the webinar today. Uh, we will be posting these slides up on, on SlideShare. You'll get a link to that as well as a recording of this webinar if you want to go ahead and share it around and give us some more feedback. Tell us how we did. We always love to hear about how we're doing on these webinars and any suggestions for improvements or future ideas for how we could um, you know, be even better in the future or different topics for the future. So with that, I just want to say thank you once again to all of the panelists. Great job staying on time, everybody. That's much appreciated, and especially with this many people. And thank you to everybody who attended. I hope this was a good use of time. Have a good day.